Hey students, welcome back. And we're gonna get into chapter three, part one. And I want you to notice the dates that we are going to be covering here. So we're talking about the dates between 1660 and 1750. And we're going back a little bit into the 1600s because we need to talk about the founding of the middle colonies. So we're gonna talk about the founding of New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And then we are also gonna talk about some laws that are, are passed by the English in the 1660s um, that basically be, sort of begin to uh, plant the seeds of discontent with the colonists. So you'll notice the name of this chapter, Creating Anglo-America. This is really where you're starting to see you know, generations of uh, colonists being born, and they're starting to identify more as um, American, maybe than English. You know, they certainly see themselves as part of the English empire, but they are going to begin to think of themselves also as American colonists. All right, so here we go with our key terms. So you'll see here, we're gonna to begin to talk about, well, we talk about the founding of New York, we're gonna talk about the Quakers, we're gonna talk about the uh, Mercantilism and Navigation Acts, those are sort of an economic phenomenon. We're gonna talk about the origins of American slavery and plantations, and we're also gonna talk about Bacon's Rebellion and King Philip's War. So there's a lot here and we're kind of jumping all over the place. So unlike um, the last uh, chapter in chapter two, where I kind of divided it up regionally, where the first lecture was about the Southern colonies and the second lecture was about the Northern colonies. In this particular case, we are gonna be talking about all of the colonies, some of the colonies, and then particular colonies. So I will, I will make sure that as we go through, I you know, say this is happening in this colony or this is happening in that colony so that you're not getting confused, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, we're gonna begin with mercantilism. So we're beginning to, um, we're, we wanted to lay the foundation for the economic realities of this time period. So 17th, 18th century, what you see as the predominant economic theory in Europe is something called mercantilism. There is no um, free trade yet. There is no capitalism. We're not gonna see that emerge until the late 18th century. So what the predominant economic theory is, is that government is there to regulate the economy and the economy is meant to promote national power. So mercantilism is a closed economic system and it encourages um, tight economic controls and it also encourages imperialism. So let me explain that, okay? You have one mother country right, let's say you have one mother country and that mother country in this particular instance that we're talking about is England, right? That is the mother country, that is where the English crown is, etc. And England then has all of these colonies that are kind of branching off from it, right? So it has its North American colonies, it has its Caribbean colonies, and it's trying to gain as much power and as much money as possible from these colonies. So what's happening is that you want to have this favorable balance of trade where you are going to have uh, more exports and fewer imports. So you are trying to hog as much of the resources as possible, right? And so you can see here when you look at this particular, um, you know, graph here, you can see that you've got the mother country, right? And the mother country typically produces uh, manufactured goods because typically the mother country will be more developed than the co colonies. Um, so you have the mother country producing manufactured goods. Those manufactured goods are sent to the colonies and in exchange for those manufactured goods, you have raw materials. So you might have gold, you might have silver, you might have fur, lumber, foodstuffs, right, tobacco, um, all of these things. So you've got this closed cycle, right? You don't let anybody else into this cycle. That's the key, right? That's the idea behind mercantilism. 
Um, the idea is, is that this is a closed loop and that basically all that money is going into the mother country's treasury. Okay, so this is a very different system than what we have today where we have capitalism and we have competition and we've got, you know, countries trading with each other and all of that. That did not exist at this time. The, the primary um, goal at this time was to have these closed economic systems that would benefit the mother country and that is called mercantilism. Okay, in an effort to try to control this closed economic system, the English are going to start to pass laws in the colonies. And you can see here, this begins going all the way back to 1650 with a series of what are called navigation acts, navigation acts. Now, you should know that in these colonies, in these early English colonies, and it didn't matter where in the colonies, so it doesn't matter if it's the northern, the middle, or the southern colonies, um, there was a lot of people that engaged in black market trade and in smuggling. Okay, and the reason for that is it really it's proximity to other nations. So it was a it was a big temptation if you were a merchant um, to sell your goods to not just the English, which is what you were supposed to do, but to also maybe the Spanish or maybe the Dutch or maybe the French, right? And everybody is sort of near each other, so it was really easy to do that. Um, you might also be able to illegally import some of the goods from these other countries, right? So there was a lot of temptation to do that. The English wanted to stop that illegal trade from happening, so they passed these navigation acts, which put restrictions on trade and on shipping. So certain products, um, so these, these navigation acts did various things, but one of the things that they did is they put restrictions on certain products. Now these would have been products that were highly valuable, right? These would have been products that brought them the most money and tobacco and sugar is a perfect example of it. So they passed these laws that said any tobacco and sugar leaving the colonies has to be transported on English ships with English crews. And then the se second uh, restriction that was put on is that those goods must be transported through English ports and those taxes have to be paid, right? Um, because again, the whole idea is that the money is circulating back to the mother country. So this is the beginning of the English really trying to put restrictions on the colonies. And you're gonna see some people and this is a hundred years before the American Revolution, but you're gonna to start to see some people that are gonna be upset by these restrictions, right? Um, and it, as time goes on, and as people become less and less uh, identified as English and more and more identified as American colonists, this, is, this tension is gonna become worse. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how New Netherlands becomes New York and how New Amsterdam becomes Manhattan. So in 1626, a man by the name of Peter Minuit, um, which who was a director of the West Indian Company, he purchased the island of Manhattan for the purposes of setting up a Dutch trading post there. Now, the Dutch never were very successful at getting a lot of people to move to this new Amsterdam outpost. Um, it just didn't attract very many immigrants, but the immigrants that did come to New Amsterdam tended to be very diverse, both geographically and religiously. So you had a lot of different um, types of people, people from different parts of Europe. You also had Africans that were settled there in New Ham Amsterdam. You also had different religions in New Amsterdam. Um, but again, as I mentioned, um, the West Indian Company, the Dutch West India Company, struggled to govern the colonists. Um, they never allowed the settlers to form their own representative government. And so it just was not a very good, stable, thriving colony, with the exception that it was religiously diverse and, you know, kind of in, in that way, it was interesting. 
1664, um, as a settlement from the Dutch Anglo War, which they were having to, uh, they were fighting, the Dutch and the English were fighting a war over colonial possessions and things, as often happened, because again, mercantilism, you want to have as many colonies as possible. Um, out of this settlement in 1664, uh, New, Netherland, New Netherland will become New York after King Charles II gave this property to his brother, the Duke of York. Um, as the new proprietor of the colony, the Duke of York exercised almost the same unlimited authority over the colony as has at the West India Company had under the Dutch. Um, although the Duke permitted religious toleration in the colony, the policy was less an affirmation of liberty of consciousness and more a recognition of the reality that New York was the most heterogeneous colony in 17th century North America. However, despite the fact that there was this um, religious toleration that took place, after um, New Netherland becomes New York, women and African Americans are going to uh, experience some changes. So prior to um, uh, New Netherlands becoming New York, um, there were women there that actually owned businesses, and that's going to change under English rule. And for African Americans, many African Americans um, were had been allowed to have skilled labor jobs um, in New Amsterdam. They are going to be forced out of those skilled labor jobs, and they are going to be replaced by English laborers. So um, despite the fact that the Duke of York continues this religious toleration, mainly because he has to, um, because that's what the colony is made up of, there will be new laws that restrict African Americans and women once it becomes New York. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the story of how Pennsylvania and New Jersey was established. So the creation of New York indirectly led to the founding of New Jersey in Pennsylvania. Um, in 1664, the Duke of York subdivided his grant and gave a portion of land between the Hudson and Delaware rivers to two of his friends. And this new colony was called New Jersey. William Penn, um, who you see pictured there, was a prominent English Quaker. Um, he was the son of an English admiral, Sir William Penn, um, and he was brought in to arbitrate a dispute between these two proprietors of New Jersey. Uh, William Quinn was a Quaker. Um, he settled the dispute, but he became interested in how establishing a genuinely Quaker Quaker colony in America. Now, the Quakers were persecuted in England. Um, they were not allowed to practice their religion openly. Um, William Penn was kind of a rebel in his family and um, kind of broke away from his dad, who was an Anglican, part of the Anglican church, um, and he became part of this Quaker uh, religion. And so when he's called to settle this dispute between the two New Jersey proprietors, he asked the, the king whether or not King Charles II, whether or not he could have this, um, this colony. Now, the Quakers have this concept of an open, generous God who made his love equally available to all people. And so it, this manifested itself in egalitarian worship services and in social behavior that continually brought Quakers into conflict with the English government. So it was not strange then when Charles II, who remained on good terms actually with William Penn, granted him land to found a Quaker colony in America. They were basically trying to get rid of the Quakers, right? Get out of here, get out of England, go, go to America and found, found your, your religious uh, colony, right? So in 1681, Charles made Penn, William Penn, uh, the proprietor of the new colony called Pennsylvania. Now, Quakers were mostly artisans, farmers, and laborers. They all, many of them flocked um, to this new Pennsylvania colony. 
and they flocked there from England, from Ireland, from Wales, from the European continent. So there were Quakers all over Europe. And Penn, when he established this colony, decided that he was going to deal with the neighboring Indians fairly. Right. So he insisted, for example, that people buy the land from the Indians instead of just take it or squat on it or whatever. Um, but despite its toleration and diversity in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was as much a Quaker colony as New England was a stronghold of Puritanism. So Penn used the civil government that he had to enforce religious morality. Um, so, uh, but as a proprietor, he did have extensive powers um, subject to review only by the king. So he was still sort of under the power of the king of England. But um, he, Penn, really stressed this idea that the exact form of government mattered less than the men who served it. So he really insisted on people being, you know, morally upstanding, etc couple of things about the Quakers that are interesting. Um, in many ways, they were ahead of their time in terms of equality. Um, they certainly had um, equal relationships amongst uh, the sexes. And so women sometimes um, had positions of power in Quaker society. They certainly could become leaders within the church itself. Um, they could become business owners. So Pennsylvania then becomes this colony that's founded that becomes known for its religious toleration. And they did have multiple religions represented in Pennsylvania. Um, and you can you, you see this as a, a very religious, diverse place. And so it will attract a lot of newcomers, especially as we get into the 18th century, into the 1700s. Pennsylvania is really going to take off. Okay, so we are going to leave the middle colonies of New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania now. We are going to return to the southern colonies, specifically to the Virginia colony, and we are going to talk about a big event that takes place there in the 1670s called the Bacon's Rebellion. And I want to give you some background on this, talk about, um, you know, because this becomes a really like seminal point in the Virginia colonial history. And it has to do with a lot of different things. It has to do with relationships between the native people, and it has to do with the large population of indentured servants. So remember how I said two-thirds of the colonial population were indentured servants. And this was especially true in Virginia and these plantation colonies where you needed a very large workforce. Um, so although African slaves did exist in the colonies, in fact, the first African slave ship called the White Lion um, brings about 20 Africans to the Virginia colony in 1619. It still remains the majority of the workforce in these southern colonies will be indentured servants um, all the way up to the 1670s. Okay, so um, even though, as I said, there are some African slaves in these colonies early on, uh, for the most part, you are going to get white indentures in these colonies up until the late 1600s. Um, and you're starting to get people who are very discontented. Um, this begins right around um, the 1660s. You're starting to get these populations of discontented poor people because they are um, former indentures and they, they don't have access to land. The other thing that's happening is you have this governor, that's this royal governor that's sent in, a man by the name of Governor William Berkeley. And in 1661, he suspends uh, local elections for 15 years. Um, and this is going to cause, again, a lot of discontent because, of course, you're not going to have representative government for those uh, 15 years. So the other thing that happens is going back to 1640, the Algonquins had signed a treaty with the English. Okay, so now I'm going to remind you of the uprising of 1622. So remember Opa Canoe, who's Powhatan's brother, 
He's mad at the English. He then takes control of the Powhatan Confederacy after uh, Powhatan dies. And four years later, he launches this massive attack on the Jamestown settlement in the surrounding areas. That's, that happens in 1622, okay? Um, once the colony becomes a royal colony after 1624, um, the English are trying to deal with the fact that um, the colonists are not getting along with the Native Americans. So they create a treaty with the Native Americans, um, and this is known as the 1640 Algonquin Treaty. And basically what it did was it drew a line that said that the English settlers, the colonists, could not go past that line. It stopped that settlement on the western frontier. <clears throat> the problem was, was there was this growing population of landless white men. Most of these landless white men are former indentures. And they are mad because they do not like this treaty because they want an opportunity to settle on this Indian land. Keep in mind that almost all that other land was already taken by these big plantation owners, etc. So they wanted to be able to go out and encroach upon this land. So in comes Nathaniel Bacon. Now Nathaniel Bacon was a newcomer to the colony, but he soon realizes that there's all of this discontent amongst the poor people. And he decides he wants to take advantage of that, kind of exploit the fact that there's, there's this anger towards the governor. And so he starts to organize them and demand that the Indians on the Western frontier be removed so that these poor landless white men can settle. Um, he uh, insists that there be a reduction of taxes for poor people, and he wants an end of this rulership by the planters, which are also known as the grandees, right? These are the big landowners, and they had a crazy amount of power and influence in the local government. So um, they launch these protests, they petition the government, and basically they are ignored. Um, and so they eventually leads to this violent protest where Jamestown is then burned by the protesters. And this sets off these three months of fighting um, between the co co colonial government um, led by William Berkeley, Governor William Berkeley, and Nathaniel Bacon and his supporters. Um, eventually, there will be a, a subduing of the rebellion, and um, he, uh, he basically, um, there will be a mass, um, you know, blowback from this, from this rebellion, um, ending in um, some people being executed and also Nathaniel Bacon dying. So here are the outcomes. Again, I kind of listed them out so that you would understand, and I listed them in chronological order. So initially, Bacon is going to, Nathaniel Bacon is going to get a little bit of traction, and he's going to kind of set up a temporary government. Um, but that is going to be very short-lived. Um, the English are going to come in. They're going to come in with soldiers. They're going to force force down the rebellion. Um, 23 people are going to be hung, um, and Nathaniel Bacon ends up dying as well, not because he's hung. He actually uh, runs away but ends up drinking some bad water and dying of dysentery. Um, and so, but this is the important part, okay, is that after Bacon's rebellion, the planters um, begin to develop a new political style. And they begin to develop, they begin to allow settlement on the frontier. So why is uh, Bacon's rebellion important? Hint, hint, if you're writing an ID, you need to know this. Um, basically, it's important because after Bacon's rebellion, these planter, the planter class of Virginia, realizes that they cannot allow these big populations of poor people to be unhappy. 
Um, and in fact, what they want to do is instead of continually importing these indentures, these white indentures, who eventually expect to have freedom and have land and all of these expectations, um, instead they want to begin to replace them with slave labor, with African slave labor. And so you see between 1680 and 1700, slave labor is going to re replace indentured servitude, and a lot of that has to do with the events that happened during Bacon's Rebellion. As a result of that, Virginia will become a slave society. Laws will be passed that start to reflect the oppression of slaves. Um, laws such as, you know, African Americans cannot own weapons. African Americans cannot move freely about society without passes. Um, so you begin to see laws being passed that reflect the influx of African slaves into the Virginia colony and then eventually into all of the other southern colonies, the Carolinas, the uh, Georgia, and that is because those plantation systems that existed there required this massive labor force. So now I'm going to talk about the plantation systems, right? The plantation systems were initially developed by the Spanish in the Caribbean, um, and they were developed um, specifically to grow, you know, massive amounts of uh, crops. And it, usually in the Caribbean, this crop was sugar. And sugar was a relatively new introduction to the European diet. And once the Europeans were able to cultivate the sugar, it became extremely popular, as you can imagine. Um, the other thing that is very popular in terms of a plantation crop is tobacco, rice, and indigo. So tobacco, obviously, for smoking, um, rice for eating, and it becomes a staple crop, and rice Tobacco, sugar was grown primarily in the Caribbean. Tobacco was grown in the Virginia colony primarily. And then rice was grown, rice and indigo were grown um, throughout the Carolinas, Georgia, and um, in those areas in the deep south. Um, you may ask yourself, what about cotton? Well, cotton um, was more of a 19th century crop. And so we will talk about that when we get to the 19th century. Indigo is a plant that um, creates this like bluish dye and it was very highly desirable. Again, any, any plant or um, in the case of cochineal insect that created a natural dye during this time was, was highly uh, desired. Um, the thing about plantations is of course they require a very large um, population of laborers and because of that the people that own the plantations are o almost always inevitably outnumbered by the laborers. And so they feel as if they need to violently oppress their labor population. And so, um, you know, you have, you know, big populations of African slaves being brought onto these plantations. And then you might have, you know, five overseers or something, you know, overseeing a workforce of, you know, 500 slaves that the the plantation owners understood could be a recipe for disaster and um, the other thing about plantation work obviously is that it's very uh, it's very hard it's very hot taxing on the body and particularly for sugar plantations um, the sugar plant itself is very sharp the leaves of the sugar plant are very sharp so small cuts were very common infections were common it was very common for people to die, um, uh, you know, working on the plantation after just a few years of working. So the other thing about the plantation system is that it required a constant flow of new slaves in order to renew it. So I did post a video on the origins of American slavery, and that was in um, module one in, in the first week. And I do encourage you to watch that video. Um, but also I want you to understand some of this um, background, right? So you've got, 
Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion happens and the planter class in Virginia starts to think, hmm, maybe it's not a good idea for us to import all these white indentures who feel like they are, um, you know, that they somehow have a right to be free and have a right to have political voice and have a right to have land, et cetera, et cetera. So um, instead, why not replace them with, with African slaves? You know, African slaves had already been being used extensively throughout the Caribbean. So the African slaves begin to be brought to Virginia for tobacco uh, cultivation. So why choose African slaves instead of indentured servants? Well, the first reason is the one that um, was addressed through Bacon's Rebellion, right? Which is that we don't want to have white former servants that think that they're entitled to land or freedom or political voice, right? Um, instead, African Americans uh, can come, Africans can come from Africa and they are exempt from common law because they are not English, right? Remember that the indentures are actually English, even though they're poor English, they still um, have the right to common law. So they have the right to trial by jury. They have the right to testify in court, right? So they have all of these rights kind of built in. Um, Africans are exempt from that. Um, the other thing about African slavery is the term of service never expires, right? You were a slave and you were a slave for life. Um, and this is to the advantage of the slave owner. Now that does make African slaves much more expensive typically than in a typical indenture would be. But also slaves who had children, those slaves, those children were also slaves. Right? So again, this is another advantage that African slavery had over indenture. Um, their skin color made them stand out. So one of the problems for the indentured service, servitude system was that um, indentures, white indentures, would often run away. And they would be able to kind of blend into colonial society. And um, that would be a lot harder for an African to do. Um, and then finally, some Africans actually had immunities to certain European diseases because the Portuguese had had contact with the Africans going all the way back to the 1400s. So by the time we get into the 1700s, that's already almost 300 years of exposure um, between these two groups. So particularly Africans living along the coast um, would have already been exposed to some European disease and unlike for example, uh, Native Americans, right, who died um, a lot from European diseases, a lot of these Africans would have immunities to diseases. So um, it's interesting to think about this because one of the things is that during this time period, when we're talking about the 17th century, the 1600s, the 1700s, um, race was not really, um, it wasn't really, there was a concept of race and people understood um, the difference of skin color and all of that, but there were, there were different categories um, based on whether people were considered civilized or barbaric. There were also different categories based on whether people were considered Christian or non-Christian, right? So um, those were distinctions that were more important than skin color. But what ends up happening with this um, system of slavery that is put in place in the United States, it becomes solely based on the color of the skin. And so you get discrimination based on skin color that really becomes this predominant theme um, throughout American history. Okay, so now we are going to leave the Southern colonies once again, and we are going to travel back up to the New England colonies and talk about another dispute between the New Englanders and the Native Americans. A massive war erupts in 1675 known as King Philip's War. So we already talked about the Pequot War, which uh, led to all of these skirmishes in the Connecticut River Valley. And um, in the decades that followed, the New Englanders continued actually to maintain peace with the more powerful Wampanoags um, while they continued to encroach upon their land. 
But in 1675, warfare between the Indians and the colonists erupted in Western Massachusetts. This war was known as King Philip's War, from which the colonists eventually will emerge triumphant, but it will also leave New Englanders with three things, an endearing hatred of Indians, a large war debt, and a devastated frontier. So let's talk about the origins of this war. Um, you see here pictured in this image, uh, somebody that uh, the Puritans called King Philip, um, his name was Chief Medicom. He was actually the second son, son of Chief Massasoit. So the original chief who had greeted the pilgrims at Plymouth and had helped them survive through that first year and had celebrated that first Thanksgiving with them. And up until this time, they had really, the Wampanoag had really coexisted peacefully with the Puritans. But when Chief Medicom, when Kim Philip, um, became the leader of the Wampanoag. He started to get very upset at how the Puritans were treating the Wampanoag nation, who had always been very kind and generous with them. Number one, they were encroaching on their land in rapid numbers. And sometimes even if they didn't build actual towns on Native American land, um, just the fact that their cows and their horses and their other um, you know, animals, they would encroach upon their villages, um, sometimes destroying their crops, and that became a big problem. I've also mentioned disputes around the fur trade, uh, disputes around trading generally and the fairness of trade, um, the fact that um, sometimes liquor was traded and this caused problems. It also caused problems between the tribes themselves. But then there was also this other thing where the Puritans began to try to force the Wampanoag to carry out their laws. So they had these, um, these laws that were called blue laws, and I talked about them in the last lecture. They are the ones where you had to restrict yourself on the days of uh, the Sabbath, that you couldn't work, that you couldn't do anything. And so those types of laws were starting to be enforced upon the Indians. Um, and also some of the Indians were kind of the ones that lived even cl in closer proximity to the Puritans. They were being asked to convert to Puritanism. They were being asked to go to church. They were being asked to dress like Puritans. So not only was there um, this uh, you know, sort of invasion of land and territory and resources and all of these things, but there's also this stripping of the culture that begins to happen. And really, um, that was the breaking point um, for Chief Medicom. And he decides to carry out this massive attack on the Puritan communities in the frontier of Massachusetts. The end result is that 12 towns were destroyed uh, many more were damaged. Um, there was a massive killing of uh, the population. About one in 10 men of military age were killed um, during this uh, war. Um, half of the existing New England towns were attacked. Um, and so the end result will be about a thousand colonists killed. But the the reaction by the colonists was quite severe. So about 3,000 Indians are gonna be killed and those that weren't killed, many of them were rounded up and they were sent to Barbados, Bermuda um, to work on plantations, basically sold into slavery. So this is going to lead to an investigation by the British after the war and it will conclude that the colonists had deviated from English rules and as a consequence, the English government would decide to govern New England more directly. So similar to what happened um, in Virginia, right after the uprising of uh, 1622, the same thing is gonna happen up here in New England just much later in the, 17, in the 1670s, where the royal government is gonna step in and go, okay, uh, we're gonna have to do something about this. So we're gonna talk more about the consequences of this change of leadership in New England 
in future lectures. Um, but also an important point is that it does change the nature of native colonist relations in New England for good, right? So up until this time, you had the Wampanoags and other tribes that were relatively friendly to the English. Moving forward after King Philip's War, that is essentially, that, that relationship is completely ruined. And, um, and there's going to be this fear in this paranoia that we're gonna see emerge from the English uh, against the native population. So here you have a map that shows the various battles of King Philip's War. You can see it's quite extensive here, um, going all over New England, Massachusetts, Plymouth, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut. Um, so all of these areas are going to experience attacks. You will also notice um, that the Indian settlements, so um, look at the the yellow here in the little explosions, those are all English settlements that were attacked, but the Indian settlements are all located here as well. So you can really see how the English had basically begun to surround these tribes. And the Wampanoag, who were the, the biggest tribe in the region, um, decided to revolt. They actually did have also Mohican and Pequot allies, the Pequots that were left um, from the attack allied with the um, Wampanoag also in these battles. So um, the native people are now going to be seen as dangerous and um, people who are not to be uh, trusted and who are to be feared. And this is going to play in large part in this adding to the anxiety of these Puritan communities who up until this time didn't have the, you know, a whole lot of fear of the natives. They, of course, there were some fear, but not a whole lot now that those fears are could definitely be amplified. All right, so that's it for chapter three, part one, and I will see you next time.